Good morning, everyone. Uh, and happy uh, what feels like the first day of fall, uh, just a few weeks late. Um, uh, my name is Randy Bell, and I'm the director of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you today for this event on the state of OT cybersecurity in the utilities industry. I'd like to thank uh, the Atlantic Council Cyber Statecraft Initiative for their partnership and cooperation on today's event. Our distinguished panelists, who you'll all meet uh, soon, and our keynote speaker, former Secretary of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff. We have an all-star lineup today to discuss this crucial issue. Um, if you haven't already seen it on your way in, today we're launching a new report by Siemens and the Poneman Institute, which provides recommendations to help utilities better address cyber risks. It's a great report and really worth uh, reading. Just grab it on your way out. It's right there by the door. Um, you'll hear much more on this topic and the report from our speakers today, but I just wanted to raise one point why I think this matters so much. Um, of course, cyber attacks provide a clear risk to the reliability of our electricity grid and everything that depends on that. But additionally, as the world faces increasing pressure to decarbonize, increasing electrification, the, the electrification of everything, is a crucial piece of the puzzle. However, growth in grid-connected connect, grid infrastructure creates additional vulnerabilities to cyber attacks. A devastating attack would not only harm the economy, but it could slow down the rate of electrification. So getting this right is not only important for the security of our electricity system, but also for achieving our climate goals. So on that note, uh, please let me turn this over to Secretary Michael Chertoff, who is co-founder and executive chairman of the Chertoff Group and served as Secretary of Homeland Security from 2005 to 2009, where he worked tirelessly, tirelessly on many issues, including cybersecurity. Uh, we're honored that you're here today. Just one quick note, um, today's discussion is on the record, streaming live, and will be archived on the Atlantic Council's YouTube channel. So during the Q&A, please uh, don't ask any questions that uh, your children or your parents will use uh, against you later on. You can join the conversation on Twitter by following at AC Global Energy and using the hashtag, uh, hashtag AC Energy. Thanks so much for being here today. And with that, turn it over to Secretary mm. Chertoff. <coughs> uh, thank you. And I just want to say all this, the streaming, the video recording, the Twitter, none of that would happen without electricity. So that's a uh, perfect lesson of the importance of this. You know, I can tell you from my own experience um, at DHS that really power and energy is at the core of almost everything that we do. Nothing in our modern society can function without having access to power, and it's the utility industry that provides that to everybody, which is why this is really an urgent matter of national concern. When you look at the landscape, um, the reality is we face a risky environment geopolitically. There are a lot of adversaries out there. Um, there is obviously Russia. There is China. Uh, there are countries that are more rogue, uh, like Iran and North Korea, even Venezuela. All of these are countries which have cyber capabilities and have the ability to carry out mischief and have done so. Uh, if you want to take an example, an unfortunate test bed for some of the tactics that can be used with cyber attacks is Ukraine, which has suffered Russian cyber attacks over a number of years, including attacks on the utility sector. There were a couple of Christmases in the last several years where the lights went out in parts of Ukraine because of attacks on the industrial control system, which allowed everything to operate. And so this is not merely a theoretical issue, but it is a realistic issue. In fact, more recently, the US Department of Homeland Security has warned that malware has been found on elements of our electric utility grid. And it's always debatable whether the malware is there simply to do reconnaissance or to steal data or whether it's pre-positioning an attack tool. Uh, and it's often not clear until the attack tool actually winds up getting executed. So that ought to indicate to us that this is not just a theoretical issue, but it is a very real national security issue. At the same time, um, the surface area for attacks is dramatically increasing. We are embarking upon uh, what many people describe as the Internet of Things. Smart devices, your video camera, your uh, refrigerator, your alarm clock, all of which are not only going to be powered, but are going to be interconnected and therefore part of the Internet. And what this does is it creates many more links in the chain 
the weakest of which creates the attack vector through which the whole network can be um, attacked. Again, to give you an example out of real life, and I won't mention the name of the entity, but uh, you, you, if you're listening, you'll know who you are. Um, some years back, there was a well-known Washington non-governmental institution which was hacked by a foreign power. And they were a little bit surprised because they thought they had good cyber defenses. And what they ultimately discovered was that there was a thermostat in a remote building that was connected to the network and that became the pathway in to get into the much more sensitive databases of the entity. So as we multiply these often, to be honest, relatively insecure peripheral devices, we are opening up more pathways to attack the essence of our uh, critical industrial control systems. Um, sometimes people take the view that this is just a question of finding the right magic tool to put on the network, and that'll take care of your problem. Um, and I still run into people who view the issue of cybersecurity as a perimeter issue. You just got to build the right Maginot line around your network and you're okay. But the reality is that works about as well as the actual Maginot line worked when the Germans simply went around it and then invaded France. Um, in fact, there's a lot more complexity to understanding the threat environment and the responses that are necessary when you're dealing with industrial control systems and operating technology like we have with the utility industry. For example, among the things which need to be considered that are not necessarily so obvious are transparency into the nature of the software you're putting on, not only at the core but at the periphery of your network operations. Are you properly configuring and are you regularly patching? Because you can buy things, but if you don't configure them properly, they're not going to work. And as we learn almost on a weekly basis, uh, new vulnerabilities are discovered. And if you don't patch and upgrade, you're going to wind up leaving yourself vulnerable to people who are continuing to use the same tool over and over again. Implementation is a challenge. Sometimes you get um, recommendations about doing things but the organization is not able to drive the impl implementation all the way down into all the capillaries of what is necessary to operate. And that basic blocking and tackling, which is not intellectually stimulating, but from a practical standpoint is critical, is an, again another element of what you need to do to make sure you are driving security in a network of your operating technology. And finally, I think an, an issue that has become more salient recently is the supply chain issue. You know, you deal with a particular vendor, a particular solution, uh, or you deal with another operating element of your network, and the question is, who has designed the hardware and the software that is a basic ingredient of what is ultimately going to be deployed on your utility network? We're coming up on a, a critical uh, example of this with respect to the deployment of 5G. Uh, those of you who follow this at all understand there is now a big debate about whether certain companies ought to be allowed to furnish the infrastructure equipment for 5G because of the concern that that will give them a chokehold on our critical systems like our utility, uh, electric utility system. And uh, so that means we need to start to think now not just about our systems, but the way in which they interact with the supply chain and the others who provide the basic building blocks and going forward. I still think we are in the process of fully understanding and learning the way in which operating technology interacts with information technology. They've tended to um, grow up in two different silos. IT has been often you know, born out of a desire to run your business processes more efficiently. Um, OT has been really the blocking and tackling of making things work in the physical world. But in reality, these are the same. I mean, one of the things we do at my, at my group, the Chertoff group, along with our partner Dragos, is to try to get a better understanding of the actual way in which traditional IT and OT actually link with each other. And by the way, sometimes I hear people say that well, our operating systems, we, we really have them separated from the internet so they can't be infected. Um, 
My response to that is if I had a nickel for every time I heard that and it wasn't true, I would be retired by now. Um, and we also have to just look at certain well-known events like, for example, what happened in Iran with Stuxnet to understand there are multiple ways to get into a network, including your insiders, people who go in and insert a thumb drive or otherwise put something directly into the network. So mapping and understanding the various relationships is something very critical. At the same time, we need to recognize that when you're dealing with operating technologies, you need to tailor your security strategies to that particular environment. And I'll give you a, a, a concrete example of that. Um, if you're dealing with traditional IT, and particularly if you're dealing with a lot of customers like uh, utility companies do, you are focused on building an architecture that allows easy interaction with your customer base, whether it's paying bills or uh, complaining about service issues or identifying some problem uh, that people are having with respect to the operation of the system. If you are creating industrial control systems, you don't really deal with customers directly, and your impulse is to have an architecture that is as self-contained and impermeable as possible. How do you mix those two? How do you have connectivity without compromising security or impairing efficiency? And these are not just technical questions, they are really business questions. And that's why they need to engage uh, senior level of management at utilities and, and, and uh, similar kinds of enterprises. Finally, to bear in mind is this. Even utility networks themselves don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, they depend upon interdependency with other actors in order to function the way they do. So for example, you need to have transportation in order to be able to make the utilities function. You need to have telecommunications to be able to communicate with people who are working for you. Um, you need to have all kinds of other relationships in order to function. And I'll give you an example out of the non-IT world uh, but in the physical world to explain how that is. Back in, in 2005, I think it was Hurricane Wilma hit Miami. It was a very powerful hurricane. And uh, those of you who know Florida know they do, do a lot of really excellent work in hurricane preparation. So they had stored up um, and ready um, all kinds of food and water in various uh, supermarkets, they had extra fuel in places, so if there was a problem with an interruption of, of fuel getting places, they had it really close to um, where they needed to have it distributed, and they felt very well prepared. Wilma hits, and then they discover something. Nobody can get to the places they need to get in order to get the food, water, and fuel. And when they go to the gas station, to fill up with gas, they discover the gas stations don't have generators, and therefore, since the electricity is out, they can't fuel their cars, which means the people who have to go to the utility to get started again can't get to the utility, so you're in a do loop of frustration. The solution there, by the way, was they eventually passed a law that said if you are a franchise gas station owner, you must have an on-site generator. But this is an example of how interdependence works in real life. Now, the good news is while we have a lot of work to do, there is progress being made with respect to the utility sector and how we deal with the combined challenges of OT and IT security. The electric power industry is mindful about this issue. They have partnered with federal agencies, including DHS, Department of Energy, FERC, and the FBI to in, uh, produce and improve sector-wide preparation for some kind of an event if, in fact, it were to occur. The Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council serves as a primary venue for CEOs and senior officials <clears throat> to address and resolve key issues about security, response, and readiness. And remember, an important element of security is resilience and response. And so the council focuses on planning and exercising incident response, and exercises are always important, deploying government tools and technology on networks, and improving the flow of information, which includes intelligence about things that might be maturing as threats. And so this kind of <clears throat> governance structure is one important element in how we continue to improve security in this space. But <clears throat> there are other next steps we need to undertake. First, we need to evaluate in all of our networks and across the sector, 
are there additional capabilities that are needed? Some of them may be high tech, some of them may, may be low tech, including manual overrides for certain kinds of functions. How do we translate what are the real threats to defensive countermeasures? One of the things we always counsel people when we're talking to them about security is, you need to understand what is your particular threat landscape. The threat actors and the tools used to go after a retail establishment that has a lot of credit cards is different from what an attacker on the utility grid is going to do because they have different objectives and there's a different landscape. And that means you need to configure your countermeasures to address the kind of tool attack tools that are likely to be the biggest risk for your particular key assets. How do you measure security performance? How do you know how you're doing? Um, what are your metrics? How often do you test? And based on that, how do you increase the incentives to make those investments in security? Because you're competing in the security space with other important functions for dollars. How do you use measures of success and information about threats to drive the appropriate level of investment in order to make sure you are securing themselves? So I think um, a study like the one here is critical because knowledge and understanding, mapping, and being able to measure are the key ways in which you understand how you drive investment and how you achieve success, bearing in mind the following overriding principle. You cannot eliminate all risk, but you can manage and mitigate the risk. And if you bear that in mind, you can achieve success. So I think this would be a great program, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot. So thanks a lot, everybody. Let me welcome uh, Melanie Kenderdine to the stage. She's going to moderate the panel, but she has uh, two slides to start off and uh, frame the conversation. Uh, Melanie is a senior fellow with the Atlanta Council Global Energy Center and is also a principal at uh, the Energy Futures Initiative. Thank you. I'm, I uh, shook Secretary Shirtoff's hand with the slide advancer in my hand, and, and it's already started the slides. So, um, the, uh, and uh, my, my, uh, my perpetual complaint when I come to Atlantic Council as I stand up here wearing a blanket um, is the over air conditioning for men's suits, okay? Men wear wool socks and it's 96 degrees out. We air condition men, uh, buildings for men. We could save a lot of electricity, reduce CO2 emissions <laughs> if men stopped wearing suits, okay? So, uh, yeah, see? I told you, it's an applause line. The, the, uh, all the women, it's, it's usually a third of the audience in an energy, uh, in energy forums, but the women all applaud. And, and we need to stop designing these for men's suits as well so I don't have to hold them in my hand. Um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, we have a fabulous panel today. Well, uh, I just wanted to uh, do a, a framing uh, of the issues. The, um, we did, when I was at the Department of Energy, we did a uh, quadrennial energy review of electricity. Um, when uh, the Department of Energy was formed, uh, because of the Arab oil embargo, and we started the Department of Energy. We, we, uh, we created the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because one sector of our economy, uh, transportation, depended on oil. There was some, a, a fair amount of electricity generation from oil at that time too, but largely because of transportation. When, uh, what, what, what you saw coming up here is uh, lifeline networks, uh, critical infrastructure, and their relationship to each other. And, and what you see, you know, there, uh, oil is related to four of them. You can see four gray lines, uh, uh, transportation, three of them. Uh, electricity and communications are, are connected to all of these critical lifeline networks. And, but electricity runs communications as well. And, and uh, I forgot to put finance on here and I added it later. It's ugly, I know, but uh, just it is connected to all of them. Also, it too runs on electricity. So, so electricity is central 
to our economy, to our security, and, but it's much more difficult than s establishing a strategic petroleum reserve. The one other thing I would do, and this is a cartoon, okay? It's a cartoon. You can tell it's a cartoon because up in the upper uh, middle of there is the Kenderdine utility. That's me, okay? So uh, you can tell I did this myself. It is to show how electricity used to work. You had one-way flows of electricity, and you had basically three sets of customers, industrial, consumers, uh, uh, commercial, and residential, and this is how it's working now. And, and with all of these different players now communicating with the grid, um, uh, uh, with, quite frankly, unhardened devices very often, and, and it makes visibility and the automation of that substation much more important. So this becomes more visible to the operators, but also the grid is the distribution system is communicating with the transmission system. That has not been the case before. That raises a whole bunch of other issues um, about the national security and secu national implications of this. Uh, and we do not have a legal structure that, that acknowledges the national implications of this. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So I'd like to invite the panelists up here and uh, uh, to, the, to the stage, and you can see where your names are. Great, thank you. <clears throat> and the uh, panelists today are, this is Dante, uh, Dante Martins, he is a cyber, cyber security technology strategy director at AES. Um, next, we have Leo Simonovic. He's a VP uh, for Global Industrial Cyber and Digital Security at Siemens. Um, and Siemens is, uh, has put out the paper that we are reacting to and responding to today. Um, next, we have... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jack Hufford. I'm done You're Jack. I'm Shapur. You're Shapur, yes, yeah. I'm sorry, oh my God. And we sat there for an hour talking to each other. Shapur in Shapur Naghibze, he is the co-founder of Chronicle Security. Um, we have Trey Hare, he is a director of Cyber Statecraft Initiative, Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council, and then finally Jack, my apologies, um, Jack Hufford, he's COO and co-founder of Tenable. And what we've asked the uh, panelists to do is to do five minutes um, uh, of, of discussion as to what they think the key issues are from their various perspectives, vendors, uh, uh, security, uh, a utility, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and let's start with Dante here. So uh, I believe the key issues that we have in our users today is the natural segmentation that we left the OT environment. to be left alone for so long with no uh, lim limited no visibility. That's one. And the digitization is something that's happening anyway. And then that increased dramatically our attack surface. So we need to react on that. And so how can we protect our system since we are exponentially growing our risk? So I think all those three combined, it just we have to adjust our cyber program in order to be able to address those additional risks. Thank you, Leo. First, uh, a thank you to the Atlantic Council and to Melanie for, and to Secretary Chertoff for moderating uh, today's event. Um, we are um, we're pleased to introduce this study. And as Siemens, um, we are at the center of the global supply chain. We're one of the largest providers of turbines, control systems, and digital equipment uh, in the industrial space, and in particular in power. Because our install base spans the globe, um, we increasingly saw customers coming to us with questions around industrial security. We were early to this journey. Um, and since then, really had to get serious about product security and then securing our 200 plus plants around the world. And so the impetus for this study was really to understand the state of readiness 
for the utility industry, but really for the whole ecosystem, for the IT players that are in this space, for the OEMs like us that are in this space, the pure play security firms that are represented here, um, and ultimately the operators. What is the state of readiness? The frequency um, of attacks targeting production of electricity, which is the lifeline and the backbone of our economy, has increased exponentially. In many ways, industrial cybersecurity has become the new risk frontier. And the question is, as these attacks become more sophisticated, more potent, more frequent, is the industry ready to address them? Because a successful attack, and as you saw, if you, read the, if you had the chance to read the report, as you'll see, um, the attacks that are, um, that are causing business impact, production impact, are more frequent, and they're leading to shutdowns and worse safety events. So, so with that, um, very excited to engage in this discussion and get various perspectives on what we, from a solution point of view, practically can do to come together um, as an ecosystem of different stakeholders and community to address this challenge. Shapur. Um, so. I'm um, uh, the co-founder, uh, product lead for Chronicle. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're now part of Google Cloud, but we start out life at X, which is Alphabet's uh, moonshot factory, uh, as we call it. it. We really focus on trying to solve really large scale problems with kind of different uh, breakthrough technologies. And these are things like driverless cars, drones, uh, you know, kind of stratospheric balloons. But in our case, the, the breakthrough technology is software, and it's uh, software that's a security telemetry platform that we're using to help solve these cybersecurity problems really at, at planet scale. And prior to founding Chronicle, uh, I spent a number of years helping build the threat intel capability at Google that we use to protect you know, our, our internal network and users from sophisticated attackers, um, you know, going back to the Aurora uh, attacks of 2009. Um, in many ways, these attacks are similar to the uh, attacks that we see um, targeting the utility sector today. Uh, this, was, this incident was a huge deal for, for Google, for the company. Uh, kicked off uh, you know, years of effort in doubling down on security uh, and really investing heavily in our own security program um, and you know, even coming up with new models um, and, and concepts uh, such as zero trust and really leveraging some of our big data capability in order to um, you know, better get visibility into what was going on in our network uh, and, and the assets. So it was, it was you know, interesting to read the report and see that just uh, you know, a, a small percentage, uh, you know, less than 20% of companies were leveraging big data for security. And we learned over the years that this you know, really fine-grained um, visibility and telemetry was critical in, in pretty much everything that security teams need to do. And that requires big data. So the, the stats actually uh, was, was kind of uh, concerning to see. I mean, really, everything starts with this visibility. And um, the, the visibility is, it's more than just being able to attack, uh, detect attacks in real time. It's also about uh, historic um, analysis. And you know, it's critical for incident response, for uh, you know, remediating, remediating attacks. And it can even really give clues about um, uh, attribution, which in the energy sector is, is pretty interesting. Um, and, and this is, and, you know, this is why scale um, is kind of the next uh, key part. Because it's not just about the data that you can see; it's about uh, being able to keep it at scale. Uh, everything is generating data today. It's, you know, not just OT devices, uh, you know, traditional endpoints, uh, you know, PCs, users themselves. Uh, you know, everything is producing data, and y you need to really make this data useful at scale. It's not just about, you know, going and archiving it on a tape somewhere, and, and you know. Uh, hoping you never need to look at it, um, but you know there's, there's been a, actually a number of studies about you know the, what we call the mean time to detection in the security industry of how long it takes to detect an attack, and the numbers vary a, a little bit, but they generally land in the six to twelve month range. So you know if if uh, you know the, the organizations aren't keeping their data around for that long, it, it you know it, you're you're really not able to even know that an attack occurred. And I think this is part of the reason why we see some of that. Um, uh, as well, with a, a, a pretty large percentage of attacks going undetected, and this is, uh, you know, as Secretary Chertoff mentioned, um, you know, very relevant in the 
utility sector, we see attackers who get access to networks and uh, just kind of map out uh, kind of what's there and then kind of lay dormant for a while. So, um, you know, those are the really the, the visibility and the scale are, are, are two huge um, components. And then the third is really around efficiency. And this is, um, you know, really talking to the, the, uh, the skills gap that we see, uh, not just in utility sector, this is every sector, uh, even out in Silicon Valley, like hiring operational security uh, expertise is, you know, almost impossible. It's, um, uh, you know, kind of in high demand everywhere. Um, so that bringing efficiency as well um, to these systems at scale is really uh, what we focus on to, to really take, um, you know, the limited resources and make as best use of them as possible. So uh, that sounds like it's cybersecurity is all kind of bad news, but it's, uh, it's, it's not the case. I, I think, you know, we've really over the, the last, um, you know, several years made a lot of uh, really big advancements in, in bringing to uh, some of the new um, uh, technologies at scale to, to this problem. And, um, you know, even uh, uh, you know, for, for as far as OT is concerned, it's starting to look a lot more like IT. I think we're seeing this ac across the board where, you know, IT networks are uh, also connected to things today, right? We've got, you know, cameras and we have mobile devices. We have things that are not the traditional um, things that you see on, on enterprise networks that we're building these systems to, to help secure. So um, there's, there's definitely, uh, you, know, you know, hope going forward that we can leverage a lot of these technologies for OT as well. Great, thank you. Trey? That's great. This is an interesting discussion uh, for two reasons, I think, at least, and I know we'll get into some details, but IT and OT, information technology and operational technology, are, are cousins of a type, right? They're both complex systems that describe capabilities you can use in the world. They're interconnected. They interact with individual people, they interact with data, they interact with the environment that they live in. But there's, I think for us, been a really crucial difference between the two in that the understanding that we have of IT has been shaped dramatically in the last 30 years by people tinkering and hacking and breaking and, and futzing with systems. And a lot of the security expertise we see in the IT community has come out of that period of experimentation and trial. And the sort of work that we see now being done at tremendous scale, especially in the cloud computing industry, to try and apply those sort of security lessons and those mitigations is born out of that experience. The OT community, I think, is in a much, much newer space and a much more emergent space. In some ways, it's a much older community. Security and reliability have been a function for how you operate a complex power system for much longer than computing machines have been around. We've been operating and generating power for a lot longer than we've been trying to compute on data. On the other hand, reliability is a very different thing from security, especially security against an adversary that has an intent, a malicious intent potentially, to disrupt that system or to alter its behavior. And so there's a, there's a relearning going on, I think, in the OT security community. And it's interesting when we hear these discussions because there's a lot of, a, a lot of desire to try to operate and have that same depth of, uh, of thoughtfulness and experimentation as it has existed now in the IT security community for a lot longer. Um, and I think that the crossing over between these two is becoming a really interesting point of dialogue. It's something that is more mature now than it was five years ago and certainly more than it was 10 or 15 years ago. So that's sort of thing one, is that these two communities are learning from each other even though they're working in very different places. But the second thing I think, and was we're going to get into this discussion about power in particular, but this report is the consequences of the OT environment are sort of understood to be very high, right? If I turn the power off for New York City, that's a much bigger deal than if I turn off the internet access to all iPhones in New York City. Some may differ depending on the age range, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there's a real consequence associated with that. And that gives us a tremendous opportunity because one of the challenges that we see in cybersecurity policy so often is that the mundane the, the best practices discussion, the slow moving standards discussion that are so critical to actually driving change in behavior, to actually locking in effective security behavior, changing the market for these products and these services that is so crucial to this discussion receives very little attention because it's not seen to be a sexy thing. It's easier to buy a product than it is to change a practice than it is to change culture in an organization. And there's an opportunity with OT because of these consequences. The minute I turn the lights off, people's attention has been grabbed. They are there for the discussion. They are ready to talk about things like standards and slow moving best practices processes. And I don't denigrate these. I think they're a crucial part of the cybersecurity policy discussion. But it's helpful to have this forcing function. What happens when the lights go off as opposed to when I turn off your iPhone? What happens when an automated car stops functioning? The blue screen of death on your laptop as opposed to in an airliner, right? These are very, very different discussions. And so I think that, that change in scale, that change in consequence can be a really useful way to drive this discussion forward and bring attention, hopefully, but also new constituencies to these issues. So I'm excited by this. As terrifying as it is, I think it's going to be a good talk. Jack? 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today as well. Tenable, uh, we describe ourselves as a cyber exposure company. And what to take that to the next level down, our heritage has been in IT vulnerability management. So it's, it's, it's discovering uh, the network and understanding its state. And it, over the last decade, we've done a lot of research on the OT side, um, the OT, the IoT, cloud, and IT. And, and that's what we give visibility to for our customers in, in, uh, across the globe. One of the things that we talked about earlier um, was it starts with visibility. And I think that that's a critical piece that we bring to the puzzle. Um, from, a, from a vulnerability discovery perspective. And I do think that you know, some of the work on the technical side between Tunnable and Chronicle could, could uh, leverage each other's data to, to make the business smarter. With regard to OT as a, uh, as a, um, a new attack surface, because people have connected a lot of devices that weren't connected before, uh, there is an exposure, an exposure that, that wasn't there you know, a decade ago. Um, but I think that these the utilities have to take advantage of the new cloud infrastructure, the new IT applications that are out there to deliver the service that, that we, we demand. Um, so we're there, and the, the question is going to be a really good discussion today about how do we uh, collectively, around people, technology, uh, and process, um, and, and policy, and figure out how to, to make it work the best way. So I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be here and look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. I, I'm gonna uh, ask Leo uh, uh, for just a minute here for the audience and, and in here and around the wherever they are um, uh, who don't live in the IT, OT world all the time. Could you explain the difference between IT and OT and the implications of the integration of IT and OT uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. Sure. Okay. Um, so operational technology and the security of that is all about the production of electricity to supply to customers um, and to the wider economy. That production means that security has to protect the power plant, it has to protect the substation, it has to protect the grid. As Melanie showed, um, that, has been, that was a classic case. That, that was the, the state of the electricity industry maybe a decade ago. That state has transformed. There's an energy transition underway with an introduction of renewables that is creating a completely different view of who produces electricity, who transmits electricity. At the same time, you have an explosion of connected digital devices that are being added.